Hello there, Crossroads. Today is Wednesday, March, or excuse me, Tuesday, March 31st, 2020. And I thought I would uh, record another video for you. You might remember that not too long ago, I said that on Wednesday evenings, we were going to look at the topic of eternal security. And so uh, I want to continue to do that and to try to have some type of normalcy to our uh, meeting times and meeting days. And uh, so I want to try to do this. And so hopefully this works. This will be my first time doing this. I just learned it. It only took me all morning to do it. Um, and uh, you can pray that this uh, works. And uh, so let me open with a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks for your goodness and kindness to us. We pray that as uh, we're in these stay-at-home restrictions, uh, that we would still be able to reach out to one another and serve one another in whatever ways we can to be an encouragement to one another and edify one another. Uh, Father, we do pray for protection. We pray for the protection of our church, the people in our church and our community. And Lord, help us to, in this time, have our focus on you and focus on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ during these times of distress and worry that so many people around us have. Lord, uh, be with us in this presentation. Uh, we pray that you would superintend it, and whatever weaknesses that uh, I might have, that those would not be a problem for the edification of your uh, people. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as you see right here uh, from the beginning, I want to talk about eternal salvation eternal salvation, and today we're going to talk about some of the biblical proofs for eternal salvation. Now, why talk about eternal salvation instead of eternal security? Why salvation instead of security? Well, I want to give you a couple reasons. The first reason is that the phrase eternal salvation specifies what we're talking about. We're talking about salvation. Uh, people might not know what security refers to. Now, if you grew up in church or you've been saved for a long time, you probably know what we mean when we talk about eternal security, but many people don't know what that means, but they do know what salvation means, and when we talk about eternal salvation, they know we're talking about salvation that is eternal. Uh, secondly, the words eternal salvation are Bible words. These words appear in the Bible. Security doesn't appear in the Bible, at least not in connection with our, our salvation. And so these are Bible words, and it's always good to stick as close to what the words of the Bible are as we possibly can. And so before we get into the proofs that we're going to look at this morning, I want to make some points of distinction. And these, these points of uh, distinction... I hope will be clear and uh, understandable. So what's the first point of distinction? That is, eternal salvation is not uh, assurance of salvation. Eternal salvation and assurance of salvation are not the same thing. Now, they are related, but they are different. Eternal salvation is the objective truth, or, or is objective truth. This means that it is the truth, whether we realize it and accept it or not. So salvation is eternal. That's the truth, and that truth always is true, and it doesn't matter if we accept it or not. Assurance of salvation is subjective. Um, in other words, it's, it is subject to our understanding. It is subject to our uh, feeling. And so while eternal salvation is always true, we don't always have uh, assurance of our salvation. And uh, maybe I can put it like this. Uh, eternal salvation is about our relationship with God. A relationship, or in particular this relationship, once established can never change. It's sort of like the relationship between a parent and a child. When parents have a child, the relationship is always parent-child relationship. That child, if he's a it will always be the son of that mom and father, and that that relationship doesn't change. But fellowship does and can can and does change. And so our fellowship means, well, what's our connection with that person? Are we in close fellowship? Are we estranged uh, from them? When we think about the parent-child relationship again, or, or 
we see this, that even though a parent and a child have this relationship that never changes, their fellowship can change. Is this child being obedient uh, to their parents? Are they, are they following what their parents say? And this idea of fellowship fall, falls into the same category with, uh, same kind of thing with God and believers. Is a believer in fellowship with God? Are they walking according uh, to the word of God? Are they in o- obedience to uh, God's instructions in his word? If our walk is inconsistent, our fellowship with God suffers. And if, and if it suffers, we might not have assurance of salvation. And, and so when we think about eternal salvation, this is about our relationship with God. It doesn't change. But when we talk about assurance of salvation, this is about our fellowship with God, and it can change depending upon our walk with God. So that's the first distinction I want to make. Uh, the second distinction I want to make is that eternal salvation is not perseverance of the saints. Maybe you've heard of that phrase before. And sometimes uh, people use the phrase perseverance of the saints when they're actually talking about eternal salvation. But these two things are different. Perseverance of the saints is a point in a theological system. And so to understand perseverance of the saints, you have to understand it within its own theological system. But I would say that eternal salvation is sort of a standalone uh, doctrine. It can it can be placed out there. It doesn't necessarily have to be integrated with a complete theological uh, system. Another difference between perseverance of the saints and eternal salvation is that perseverance of the saints includes in that theology what uh, includes the believer's obedience to God. It includes what the believer has to uh, do in their re- in their fellowship with God, while eternal salvation totally focuses on what God has done and is doing. It, it focuses on God alone. The believer has um, n- no impact upon uh, this doctrine whatsoever. And so I hope you understand those differences. They are, they, are, they are key for us to understand this topic. And so the plan for this study from this point on is, uh, first, we're going to start with biblical proofs for eternal salvation. And uh, we're not going to get through all those proofs today. I think I have about 14 points uh, for the biblical proofs of salvation. We're only going to get through, through three of those uh, today. And then uh, next week we'll we'll try to tackle uh, a chunk, uh, another chunk of those biblical proofs. Uh, secondly, uh, we're going to see how other doctrines are impacted if you believe you can lose your salvation. So that has an impact upon uh, other doctrines, and we want to see what that impact is. Sometimes this is called negation theology. We understand more about a particular doctrine if we can understand the negative uh, part of it. If it's not true, what does that mean? And thirdly, we're going to look at some problem passages for eternal salvation. There are some passages in the Bible that seem to suggest you can lose your salvation. Well, they're in the Bible, so we can't ignore them. And so what do we do with them? And uh, we'll spend some time on those passages so we have a good understanding of what they're talking about. Uh, So let's move on to these three biblical proofs for eternal salvation that we're going to look at today. And the first one involves the words or phrase eternal, eternal life or everlasting life. And so the first thing I want us to understand is that the word eternal and the word everlasting, they're the same. They're the exact same word. Um, They're synonyms. They're synonymous with one another. Uh, The underlying original language words here are the same. They only come over uh, different in English. Secondly, I want us to understand that uh, eternal life, this phrase everlasting life, is a New Testament phrase. Uh, A quick search of this phrase in the Bible reveals that outside of Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, this phrase only occurs in the New Testament. Now, this doesn't mean that the Old Testament doesn't have this same idea, the same idea of salvation and that it is forever. Uh, My point here 
It is only to say that the phrase eternal life or everlasting life uh, doesn't occur in the Old Testament except for Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Um, the third point relating to this phrase uh, deals with the, the meaning of the word life. In the Greek New Testament, there are two words for life. The word zoe, Z-O-E, and the word bios, B-I-O-S. You might sort of recognize that word bios because it's the word from which we get our word biology. Now, the difference between zoe and bios is that zoe refers to the substance of life, the essence of life, uh, life itself, while bios refers to the living of life, the functioning of life. And in, the, in our phrase that we're interested in today, this phrase eternal life, uh, the word life here is always the word zoe. It's always talking about the substance, the essence, talking about life itself. Uh, we're also, we should also note that the opposite of zoe, the opposite of this life, is death. So the opposite of zoe is death. The fourth thing I, I want us to see here is the meaning of the word eternal. Uh, the Greek word for eternal is ionios. Uh, this word can have two basic meanings. Um, the first meaning is a long time, a long period of time, and the second meaning is a time without end. And even the, the leading uh, dictionary of New Testament Greek also says that this word pertains to a period of time without beginning or without end. It's eternal. It's talking about eternality. And so when this word eternal is coupled with life, is talking about a, is it, let me ask the question, when we couple this word eternal with the word life, is it talking about a very long life or is it talking about eternal life? It has both of those, the word eternal has both of those meanings. When we consider that the opposite of life is death and that death marks a definite end, I think that helps us to rightly conclude that eternal life is life without end. It goes on forever. And so what conclusion we, can we draw here? Well, I think it's this. If eternal life is eternal, it never ends. It's never ending. If you can lose eternal life, then it was never eternal to begin with. And if you can lose eternal life, why would the Bible say it, would call life eternal? Why would the Bible call life eternal if it's not eternal? And so if eternal life is eternal life, is actually eternal, I should say, then you can't uh, lose it. Now let's go to the second point of proof for eternal salvation. And that's John 3.16, a very familiar uh, verse to us, but I'd like to take a closer look. And, and maybe you can see the pointer on the screen. Uh, maybe not. Um, I'm not sure how to get a uh, larger pointer here. I'm sure there's a way to do it. I just don't know uh, how that is done. But I want you to see a few things in this verse. I want, us, I want us to see, first of all, that this verse tells us God loved the world. God loved the world. This word so right here is the word that means in this way. And so we might put it this, uh, this first phrase like this, for God loved the world in this way. So God loved the world in this way. And in what way did he love the world? He gave his only begotten son. So this is this is the way in which God loved the world. He gave his only begotten son, and the idea is that he gave his only begotten son to the world. Now, what was the purpose for God giving his son to the world? That, right here, this word right here, that, or we might translate that, uh, in order that, or for the purpose that, 
Whoever believes in him, in the Son, should not perish but have everlasting life. So God's purpose in giving the Son is that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, and this giving of the Son is because he loves the world. And, and so those who don't believe, those who don't believe the Son perish, but the ones who do believe in the Son have everlasting life. They have it. Everlasting life is theirs. It belongs to them. And if everlasting life is truly everlasting, then they have everlasting life. So that's the second uh, proof, biblical proof, for eternal salvation. Now let's look at the third and final one uh, for today. John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Now, let me ask you a question. Who has everlasting life? Well, the one who hears my word and believes in him who sent me. This is the one who has everlasting life. Let me ask you another question. Can you hear the gospel, hear the words of Jesus, and not have everlasting life? Absolutely. Many people hear the gospel, but they don't have everlasting life. So you have to hear and believe. You have to hear and believe. Believe is the operative word here. You have to hear the, word, the words of Jesus. My words will say, hear the gospel and believe, and then you have everlasting life. And I would also like to point out that this word has here, this is a verb, this word has is in the present tense. In other words, you have this everlasting life right now. As soon as you believe, you have this everlasting life. Now let's go on to the next phrase. And shall not come into judgment. And shall not come into judgment. Literally, and comes not into judgment. Again, the verb here is come, and it's in the present tense. So not only do you presently have eternal life, but you're presently exempted from judgment. When you believe you have eternal life, and, it, and that eternal life exempts you at that time from judgment. It's a present reality. You're not going to come into judgment if you have eternal life. And you have eternal life if you hear the, the gospel and believe. Now let's go to this last phrase. But has passed from death unto life. Now I want us to notice the very first word here, the word but. And maybe you can see my cursor there. The word but. And, and the word but is introducing a contrast between this phrase here, has passed from death into life, and the phrase come into judgment. So it's contrasting those two against uh, one another. And so the one who believes has everlasting life, and instead of coming in unto judgment, coming into judgment, uh, they have passed from death unto life. So they've passed from the, so instead of coming into judgment, they have passed from death to life. And this word here has passed is the idea of passing over or to cross over or to go from one place to another. And so instead of coming into judgment, instead of going into judgment, when you are saved, when you believe and have everlasting life, this makes you pass from death and judgment into life. In other words, you skip over death if I can put it that way, you, you move out of the category of death and judgment and into the category of life. You move from the status of being judged and have eternal separation from God to now you have the status and position of life. I also want to point out here lastly that this phrase has passed, and I know I'm going to get a little technical here, but it's important uh, for you to understand this. Uh, this word here has passed. This is one word in the Greek language, and it's in what we call the perfect tense. Now, what does that mean? It means 
that the idea that this verb is um, communicating that it has passed was a completed action. It's a completed action that happened in the past, but the results of that action continue on to the present. So has passed from death to life. This happened in the past. And the point in time at which this happened is when this person hears the gospel and believes and receives everlasting life. This is when they have passed from death to life. And the results of that action continue on to the future. Continue on specifically, the present tense means it continues up to the present time of the writer. But I want us to see that the fact that we're talking about everlasting life, and we're talking about death, and we're talking about life, it means that the result of being saved, which is what we would call this up here, when you're saved, the results of that continue on for eternity. And so that's what this verse is talking about. If you are saved, if you have heard the gospel and believe the gospel, you, ha you have everlasting life and you're not going to come into judgment. And instead of coming into judgment, you have actually passed from the position and category of death to now and to the position and category of life, and you are in this category, you are in this status for eternity. So I hope that was a little bit encouraging to you today. Let me know how this video works for you, whether this is a good way to do it or whether it's too complicated. Well, may the Lord bless you today as you serve him.